would like to open the conversation between the two gyms by first uh, highlighting why we've titled this, What Are You Going to Do About That? And so, Jim Gray, if you could tell us how we came up with this title for this talk. Uh, well, I have to <coughs> take you back to 1964, and I'm not, I can't do the math to say how long, long ago that was, but uh, we had a very young family, uh, twins and a little boy all under the age of two, and I was driving to Banff, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was on just after the Calgary Stampede, and they came on the radio to say that Prince Philip had been there, and, and the princess, and but they had had a very disappointing turnout. And I said to my, 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 wife, my late wife, Josie, I said, you know, you're from Manitoba, I'm from Ontario. All my friends are from Saskatchewan or British Columbia. I've got one friend that was born in Calgary. They, they've got a, we're all in, been here in the energy business and uh, they should have an oil show at the Calgary Stampede. And she said, what are you gonna do about it? And that's how this, that's the engagement here this morning. So I wrote a letter to the editor, which I, that weekend, and then it turned out to be too negative. So I wrote a, pos a, a proposal for an oil show at the Calgary Stampede, which is, of course, the uh, epitome of our culture here in, in Alberta and in Calgary. And uh, then I went around town and got, uh, and I was about 30 at that time, and got Cam Sproul and I got various other people to endorse this, none of whom I met, I knew. And then I went to the board and they approved it of the Calgary Stampede and then I took six months and every single day I spent at the Calgary Stampede. I took uh, a half day, twice a month off to go back to my company, Kermagee, to collect my check <laughs> because they were paying me. I did the first three months without their knowledge uh, and down in Oklahoma City, but then they finally twigged onto it and became very enthusiastic. And so that was then called Flair Square. But I learned uh, two lessons, I guess, from that. And by the way, it morphed into today's oil show. But it, we set records every day at the Calgary Stampede. I, mean, I learned two lessons. If you have a good idea, then the doors are open to you. People will listen to you if you have a good idea. I was 30 years of age, knew no one, and, um, <clears throat> and so I gained a lot of confidence at that time at a relatively early age that if there was something that was really worthwhile that people would want to hear that they were available. And I just had to figure out how to do it, but they were, the, they were available. And that helped us later when we started Canadian Hunter. Um, the other thing I, that was an unde, unintended consequence of this is that absolutely nobody knew me in 1965. By the end of the oil show, I was telling them, we drilled this, we had everything at the show. We had drilling, we had a dr triple derrick drilling rig and we had pump jacks and steam units and seismic and products and we drilled a 1500 foot hole and I never forget the president of SO came out and he didn't know me. So you're gray? Well, I'm gray. He said, you're having trouble drilling that hole. And we were because it was just boulders. And he said, the reputation of the industry is on you getting that hole drilled. You get that hole drilled. And so one of the unintended consequences was nobody knew me in 1964. And I didn't do it for this reason. But by the end of the all show, I knew everybody. <laughs> and uh, it was just a just a natural consequence. It just, just happened, but it was a wonderful, wonderful success. It wouldn't have happened if my wife hadn't said to me, well, what are you going to do about it? That was 50 years ago, right? So, Jim, what do you think has changed or what's happening today? Jim DeWalt, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. You know, and sorry for, uh, for stealing your name, Jim. It makes it a lot harder for Lauren. But uh, over time, uh, we find that management decision making has really changed and that kind of initiative and perseverance that Jim Gray shows to this day, uh, we, we have to ask ourselves, why is there not more of that? What are some of the barriers to that? 
And uh, what I'm finding in the research is that there's been more and more emphasis on consensus building. And we see it on a big picture with things like we can't build a pipeline. We can't get approval on major projects, but it also happens in small organizations because it starts, like uh, uh, this diagram shows, stage one consensus is let's get some general agreement. Let's have some trade-offs, let's work together, and that's all fine until the decision-making team gets into a stage two where one person, and it's usually somebody with a, a, a certain agenda, says no. I'm not going to compromise. And, uh, and it eventually gets to a point where the organization or the tribunal or whatever feels that they need unanimous consent. And then that can really break down to a full-born stalemate or a dictatorship. And I think these are, um, this movement over time from you know, the Mad Men days uh, that Jim talks about when the boss just said, this is what we're doing, and you move forward, and people really appreciated and rewarded initiative, it's getting a little harder to do because uh, when you drive for, for consensus, quite often rationality has to give way for emotional concerns. And that's a lot harder for uh, businesses or for the government to really deal with. So, Jim, can you think of, I'm thinking of an example you gave us on the South Health campus, and how do you see that turning away from the need to get consensus? What happened on that South Health campus? <coughs> well, I'll tell that story, but just a comment. I've never seen anything visionary, creative, happen that comes out of a consensus. Um, if we were to all try to come up with something in this room here today that is really visionary, I mean, there were six guys built, uh, and it would have been six guys and women, but at the time it was guys, built the CPR. If we'd had a, a, needed a consensus of half of Scotland to build the CPR, it, we'd never have the CPR. So it was consensus is needed in the absence of leadership. Leadership can, can, ha, can manage consensus, create consensus. And I will, I will say this, um, uh, you have to be imaginative and you have to think. And so, as you know, I swim. And I went to a meeting at the zoo of 300 people planning the South Health Campus. And I listened for four hours. And finally, at the end of four hours, they said, does anybody have anything to say that hasn't been talked about? And I said, yeah. Put up my hand. I said, I haven't heard it. This is the South Health Campus. It's not the South Acute Care Hospital. And I haven't heard anybody talk about keeping people out of this hospital. I haven't heard anybody talk about wellness. I haven't, and it's the South Health Campus. And they said, well, do you have an idea? And I said, yeah. And um, they said, well, what is it? And I said, I'll have it on your desk tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So I wrote it up that night, and I suggested they build a YMCA in the middle of the hospital. It's never been done before and that it be for the nurses and the doctors and the patients, pre-operative, for the, the workers, the, et cetera. And um, so the Jack Davis and David Tour are running the health at that time. Uh, and I see Jeff McKeg here, his father played such a wonderful, wonderful role in that institution. And uh, they said, well, Jim, we've approved the idea at our board. We like it. We'd like you to study it. And I said, I'm not studying it. And they said, they got mad and said, well, you have to study it. I said, no, I want you to announce it <laughs> on the basis of a one-page letter. And they said, well, but tell us, what are you going to do? And I said, and this is the lesson I learned. The strategy, the vision was to put wellness in the hospital. The tactics, the details where are we going to have one exercise bike or 10? Or are we going to have this or are we going to have that? And you can't ever allow t the, t the details of tactics to trump strategy. And so we did. We had a press conference on um, uh, Dave Broncagne and the head of the hospital and all the rest. And Chris Eagle's here today, and he played a big role in this. And we announced it. And then they said, well, exactly what are you going to do? And I went through my strategy versus tactics talk, and I said, 
stay tuned, but do you, the Herald, this was the Calgary Herald, do you agree we should have wellness there? And they said, of course. We also agree with the sound of music and apple pie. <laughs> and I said, fine. That's what we're announcing. But if we had studied that, I guarantee you, all my very, very good doctor friends would have studied that idea right into the ditch. We would have ended up with a new research facility. We would have ended up with another operating room. I don't know what we'd ended up with, but it would not have been a wellness facility. And now it's operating. 50,000 square feet at the South Health Campus. And uh, it's open 24 seven. They've got ideas we didn't even dream about. And so the lesson I took away from that was strategy is different than tactics and don't allow tactics to trump strategy. Don't, uh, don't, most of us can talk about details. A few can talk about vision. Don't let the details destroy the vision. So, Jim, we talked or mentioned death by consensus, but what are some of the other reasons why we, as a group, don't step forward and take action? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, um, you know, Jim, I, I just want to clarify one thing. I, I don't, you know, uh, well, actually two things, because um, you said strategy is very important over tactics. Um, do you find that people have lots of ideas? Like, my sense is there's lots of great ideas out there. And... Um, do people just naturally go to the tactics and then the study? Is that where the, the downfall is in moving forward with, with ideas? Well, one of the things governments will do will say that we like your idea and, and now we'd like to study it. When they say that, that's a proxy for we don't want to make a decision and we're not particularly interested in what you're doing. Uh, but they don't want to say no, so they'll study it. Um, I think people get scared about, about making those, those uh, divisions. But you can, I'm not particularly interested in the details of how we're going to treat. We can, we, at Canadian Hunter, for instance, we hired a wonderful, wonderful team of people. Uh, did we have consensus? Yes, but it was a managed consensus. It was your consensus. And, and, but we shared, <laughs> we shared that with everybody, but, but when somebody came in and said, well, we're not going to do this, uh, and it was in opposition with the core values and vision of the company, then I'm sorry, but um, that, isn't gonna, that isn't gonna fly here. So analysis and rigor is important, but set your strategy and direction. And keeping the strategy, we always used to put it on the wall. You should, your strategy should be on one piece of paper. Your strategy yeah. doesn't have to be a book. The tactics can be a book. But the strategy, you should be able to put your strategy down on one piece of paper, and it should be on every wall so that everybody reminds themselves of the fund basic vision every day. Well, speaking of books, there's, there's a huge uh, library of research on why things don't move forward and resistance to, uh, to new ideas and the change. And in particular, uh, I was taken by uh, research by the Advanced Institute of Management in the United Kingdom. They had 12 excuses for why new ideas don't move forward. And they really bundled down into three pies, uh, or three pieces of the pie. Resistance from customers, and this is quite often, I don't know if you find this, but customers will say, well, wait a minute, I like the product the way it is. I don't, I don't really want you to change things. And Clayton Christensen writes a lot about this in his term, disruptive innovations. And you quite often have to go right off the bat looking for a new customer. Uh, resistance from the supply chain. So your suppliers, I mean, they've got their machinery all set up and they're producing what, uh, what you've been buying. They're, they're quite often not anxious to be changing because you think there might be a new idea out there. But the one that I really want to focus on is resistance from within. And uh, there's four excuses that were identified that I think, if I can get to them, whoops, I went too far. Um, it goes something like this, like the argument would be, well, we can't do that because it's not our business. And the example that they use was Encyclopedia Britannica uh, failed to adopt uh, new technologies uh, like CDs and internets, uh, the internet for their, and of course Encyclopedia Britannica disappeared. 
uh, not invented here. I'm sure you've heard that before. Well, we can't do that because we didn't invent it here. Uh, we've never done it before is often an excuse that's used. Um, and the example that they, they had was that Xerox missed going to the small copiers first because they said, well, we've never done that before. The big machines work for us. And let's set up a pilot, which I think is similar to yours, let's study it, uh, which is quite often used as a, uh, a sense of saying, well, you know, I don't really want to argue with you anymore. <laughs> I'll give you some uh, little, uh, our smallest market to wor work with, and you see what you can uh, come up with for that. But really the point is that uh, people will come up with a lot of different uh, excuses why they, they don't want to move forward. And you can also look at it a different way in terms of bundling in into three responses. Let me just get here. Uh, people have skepticism. So that might be heard as, if it's such a good idea, why hasn't it been done before? Have you ever heard that before, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Many times. Or apathy, uh, we need to have a study done, as you said, to validate it, or just laziness, like, uh, oh, we don't have the resources, we don't have the people, we don't have the money. Does that sort of track with your experience, what the research says? Well, it, it really does. I mean, skepticism, there's quite a few geologists in the room, I assume, but I started off as an exploration geologist back in a, in a totally different time of technology, but all vertical wells. But uh, 75 to 90 percent of what we did failed. And I can remember as a geologist having to go in to talk to very senior people and uh, convince them that, that we should drill this well. And one, that first one, uh, well, if this is such a good idea, Jim, why haven't a whole bunch of other people done it? I've heard that all my life. Uh, and I, I don't listen to that, to that, that anymore. Uh, people, you just cannot survive listening to that sort of thing. And you have to be convinced. I'll just tell, we started Canadian Hunter in 1973. Everybody was leaving the business in 73. That's when OPEC, they, got, they really started to flex their muscles in 73. But we could see an opportunity to stay. And Al Powers, who was now passed away, but was then the president of Naranda, told me something else that I've never forgotten. And that is when everybody else is leaving and you can see a reason to say, and it, 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 it survives the test of, of common sense and analysis, not study, but just common sense, then that is an opportunity. Don't, there is no money going with the herd. You just cannot, you cannot do anything creative going with the herd. So skepticism and apathy, laziness, when we put our organization together, that was not a word I ever used and ever was used to describe our company. I mean, uh, there's no place. You've got to have energy. You've got to, have, you've got to be practical and realistic, but you have to have enthusiasm. You've got to be realistically positive at all times, particularly in our business. And, and apathy, uh, you got to get the right people on the bus, and the right people on the bus aren't apathetic and they're not lazy. And if they're apathetic and they're lazy, and they stay apathetic and they're lazy, they got to get, get on a different bus. Not my bus. they got to get on somebody else's bus. And, uh, but skepticism uh, is something, there is not such a thing as a good idea without skeptics. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. And uh, that's the opposite of this consensus building. I mean, we, we just can't, you just can't, you must expect that. And you have to listen very carefully to the skeptics because every now and then one of them has a good idea and you've got to incorporate that idea. And you've got to listen very carefully, but you can't be driven by them. That's fabulous. Do you ever have uh, young people asking you for advice? Young people? Pardon me? Do you ever have young people asking you for advice on what to do these days? I often say that the most valuable words that I've ever, that I, in my business career, have used is, I need a little advice. I go to people every, almost every day of my life asking them for their advice. First of all, there are, most people are honored that you ask them for their advice. They're, 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 they're grateful somebody finally asked them for their advice. And... Uh, <laughs> And you, you learn things from people. 
And so I have people all the time, but I come back to the theme of this, this morning's discussion. All the time with the young people I meet, well, what are you going to do about it? Don't ask me if you, I can give you some advice, but that's my advice. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to grab hold of your career or grab hold of the circumstances and make them work for you? How are you going to do that? And, let, uh, and, and, and let's talk about how you can do that, but, I want, but you're the one that has to operationalize this. You're the one that has to execute it and make it work. You told us a couple of great stories, one with PhD students, and uh, you, you told Lauren and I a couple of great stories, one oh, with yeah. PhD students and one with a coffee shop. I was invited, oh, oh yeah. yeah. I was walking through Bankers Hall, and here come these three young guys. Again, I must say, it could have been three young women. <laughs> and they all had, you know, this is today's person with a coffee. Everybody's arm is cocked with a coffee in it, it seems. <laughs> and then they had coffees. And they said, Mr. Gray, and I, I didn't know them. They said, yeah, we're, well, we're on the cusp. We may lose our jobs. We're worried. What's your advice? And one of my very, very good friends said, has always said, remember, you asked for my advice. And so I said to the boys, I said, remember, you asked for my advice, so don't get upset. And I said, well, what the hell are you doing coming down here getting coffee at Second Cup? Why aren't you working at your desk? Why aren't you upstairs making yourself indispensable to the company you're working for? How come I, it infuriates me to walk through Bankers Hall and see a long lineup of people at 10.30 waiting for coffee? I thought, the, we, I thought eight hours pay was for eight hours work. And, and I just don't, un, I, truthfully, I, I don't understand how you can take an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon to go down, get a coffee, which, by the way, there's, a coffee isn't a coffee anymore. But <laughs> putting that aside, uh, and, and then go back up to work and then come to me and ask me what you should do to keep your job. I would be working my buns off to become indispensable to my employer. And w only one of you three are going to be indispensable, probably. And the other two probably are going to have to look for someplace else. What does your employer need? He wants to lower his costs. He wants to compete in today's world. He wants to talk about innovation and, and new ideas. And he, he wants to continue to be relevant. And you're not going to be relevant in my company if you're spending two hours a day down at the second cup getting a cup of coffee. You just aren't going to do it. And I think we, we've got a sense of entitlement in this province. I've talked to people about that, Tavani, others, that, that, that we're entitled to these things. We're not entitled to this. Nobody owns us. Nobody owes us, owes us anything. Uh, we have to defend ourselves. We have to stand up for ourselves. We have to be, we have to be, uh, somebody has to put value on what we can bring to the table. And, and so the boys, by this time, by the way, their eyes were about as big as saucers. <laughs> and I'm, I can guarantee they were, they were not entirely thrilled with the answer that I was giving them. But they asked me. Can I just clarify that an hour at Starbucks is not the same as an hour at the Haskane hour. That's a good hour to be at the Haskane hour. <laughs> I got an hour at 6 30. By the way, when young people ask me, we'd like to get together, Mr. Gray. And I say, fine. Like some ideas, fine. I say, let's meet uh, at 7.30 at the Sheraton. That kicks out half of them <laughs> right off the top because they, they've never been anywhere at 7.30 in the morning, except in bed or, or, or whatever. And so, um, uh, but I, I, be I believe, by the way, that maybe it's my age, but there's, there's something precious about your, your health and your body and your time. And you have to deal with time as one of the most precious commodities that you've got. I want to uh, build a little bit off your point on the skeptics are important. Because uh, some of the research, again, on uh, teams, because teams are important. And we all work in teams if for no other reason, uh, because we need multidisciplinary. We need lots of uh, expertise. 
The, uh, this is Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of the team, and some people find it very surprising to see that he feels that one of the reasons why teams fail is because they have a fear of conflict, that they won't allow conflict to happen. And that ties into this next uh, slide there, wh uh, which is on your table card, uh, which might be a little confusing for people, but the point here is that there's a certain level of conflict that's really healthy because you want people to be honest. So if you're working in a management team, if you're on a project team, if you're too far on the left where there's no conflict at all, that can actually have negative or very low performance output because people aren't telling the truth. They're not, the skeptics are being quiet. They're not saying what they think might go wrong with the project and sometimes that can lead to real failure. And then in the center, you've got people that are open, they're honest, um, and all of the information gets on the table. At the same time, you can't have too much conflict because that can uh, often detract from the focus at hand. And in fact, that can sometimes become very uh, personal and even mean-spirited. And, uh, you know, I might say uh, we've got uh, Brett Wilson here, which is a great, fantastic show last night, the 10-year anniversary, but I would say, you know, Kevin O'Leary. It's all very personal, it's directed, uh, Donald Trump. And so that level of conflict uh, doesn't necessarily help a team to move forward. Um, so would you agree with that? You've got to have some degree of conflict to have an, an effective team. If you're not seeing some kind of conflict, you've got to ask, do you have the right team? Right. I, I would agree, Jim, but I, I, the word conflict kind of bothers me a little, has always bothered me a little bit. There's a, there's a, there's a tendency to think about violence, I mean, violent conflict. Um, big, white-hot arguments. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of, of, of a more constant dialogue of challenge. You've got an idea, I build on that idea, or I challenge part of that idea, then you come back to me, and I, and I don't like the institutionalizing of conflict. I think that challenge and discussion and refinement and listening and, and defending and attacking uh, are all part of building strategies and building, building operations on a constant basis, not rather than um, where it, it builds up to the point. I used to, I come from Curtin Lake and we used to work underground and, and the, the rock at five or 6,000 feet was working all the time. You could hear it clicking and banging and whatever. And the miners would all say, that's fantastic when it's doing that. When it goes silent, they get out because the pressure's building up and wow. something bad's gonna happen. And so I think of that as this. Wow. I think that discussion and challenge, all done in, a, in the social context of good manners and thoughtfulness for other people, we used to have a sign at Canadian Hunter, treat everybody else as you'd want to be treated if you were that person. And that goes for this as well. And so conflict is kind of like, that's what I see on TV every night. I see conflict. But when you and I just have five or 10 or 20 five minute discussions in a day, we, we resolve those incrementally rather than allowing them to build up to be, uh, to be damaging to the relationship. So um, part of that is, do you think there's a fear of conflict from people? Have you seen that where people just, we're going back to the death by consensus almost, they're afraid to be the, the nail that pops up and says I've got a good idea? Uh, having a fear of conflict. Yes. Well, well, to my way of thinking, like at, at the, the organizations I've been in, if you have constant dialogue, it doesn't build to that point where you're fearful of it. Okay. And, and, but there has to be dialogue. I'm, I, I lament one thing about the phones and the technology is that many of our young people are losing many of their interpersonal skills, in my opinion. And I see people in an, in an office and they'll email from here to there in an office without any walls. Then they're sending emails to each other. And I, I can't believe it. And I, I'm, but I'm, I recognize, there's a lot of things I can't believe because I'm getting too old. But, 
but nevertheless, many of our interpersonal skills, eye contact, the, the, the thoughtfulness that goes with kind of gracious behavior, uh, those, those are skills that we don't lose, that I'm sorry, that we do lose if we, if we allow these other processes to dominate. And I think that's a big mistake. I have to tell you that at 528 Ninth Avenue Southwest, next to the liquor, there used to be a liquor store right on the corner. There were two guys in 1957, 58 working. Both of them had their noses buried in paper. I was a geologist and I had my nose buried in the maps and Dick Haskain was an accountant and he had his nose buried in the books in the same company at the same time and we weren't given time to talk to each other and yak and discuss, we were working. And isn't it interesting that here, half a century later, we're back uh, at this point. So we're very grateful for what you do there. Okay, do we have a question? Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Gray. Jennifer Martin from Telespark Science Center. One word that I haven't heard this morning is risk. And it feels to me like it's implicit in much of the conversation, but I'm just wondering where you would put risk into conflict, into uh, strategy as well. Well, uh, <coughs> that's, that's a complicated question. I don't have a simplistic answer to it. But, but I think part of it is constant dialogue. In other words, we don't get there in major departures. We get there incrementally. We get there a little bit at a time. Uh, we bring each other along. We give each other ch uh, an opportunity to change their mind. And I have an opportunity to change my mind. And, um, and, and so we don't allow the pressure to build up to the point where it, it creates either anger or obstruction or or uh, negative uh, dialogue or whatever, uh, of conflict, et cetera. Um, I hope that helps, but, but none of these things happen instantly. They're, they're, they're not a picture, they're a process. Uh, just to build on that question of risk, in my mind and opinion, the skepticism that starts at the beginning points out the risks that you're going to have in whatever project you've got. And it is appropriate to consider all of those risks. And that's why you want the skepticism, but don't let them get you off and say, well, it's too risky. Uh, every day is a risk. You're walking across the street, you get hit by a bus. And that's part of the problem we've got in this industry, this province today, and everything going on, we are at high risk of not doing things. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, myself included, are in denial about, well, the price of energy will come back and we're going to be okay. Maybe it won't. There's too many things happening too fast. It's valuable to write down what those risks are and then you start knocking off the risks, right. whatever it is. I, c I couldn't agree more. I spent Monday and Tuesday in New York City at the <coughs> Bloomberg Energy Conference. Uh, John Kerry spoke, others spoke, and when I, my takeaway was the change in technology that we're, particularly you are going to, uh, uh, to experience, is breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking, the speed with which uh, everything from uh, energy generation to electrical cars to uh, graphene. Nobody's heard of graphene. It's the thinnest substance ever invented in the world. It's a micron thick. It's the strongest substance in the world. It, it moves electricity 1,000% faster than copper. And, and it's a brand new substance. And nobody even dreamed about it five years ago. Well, think of the things that are going to be here five and 10 and 15 years. And today, we'll think of today, 2016, as the Model T Ford years. Change is embedded and it's getting faster and faster. And we in Alberta don't have, there are no entitlements. We have to defend ourselves. And we, we have some big, big challenges. And I, I the, it's up on the board, but the, the, the symbol for crisis is the same as the symbol for opportunity. And, 
in one of the Chinese languages. And, and it's true in my life. You can't allow the challenge to put you into shock. You've got to think about how that challenge can create an opportunity. And we're going to desperately need that kind of thinking, that kind of visioning that Ron was speaking about in this province going forward. Because I'm, there's, there's some very, very tough water ahead. And uh, somebody will say, that's the time I, my father was a mining engineer. He said, when times get tough, that the mud gets deeper, you put on bigger cleats. And, and that's what we have to do in Alberta. We have to put on longer cleats. We have to get serious. We have to work hard. We don't want to, life is going to be different going forward for everybody on the globe than it's been in the past. And we've got to, be, we've got to defend our quality of life. We've got to defend our economic uh, opportunities for our young people. And nobody is going to do it for us except ourselves. And we have to get very, very serious about this. And we have to work night and day to preserve those, those fundamental values that make this just about the best place in the world to live. And it's up to us to keep it that way, and it's going to be hard work. Okay. Um, we have a question right here. Uh, good morning, Rick Hillary. Uh, Jim, this is directed to you, and most of us, uh, yourself included, have made reference to the passage of time, and you've recounted uh, how you started in the business and where you are now, and from that, you've gained much experience, much wisdom going forward. Uh, like most of uh, your experience, many of us have done the same thing. We've moved from the sphere of doing to the, the sphere of advising, and that normally means you end up as a director of various companies. And uh, the, presumably the reason you're there is they're seeking your advice because of your experience and your wisdom you've accumulated over time. Uh, can you uh, take your key message here and give us your advice on how boards should react to the changing environment we have today and how you get a dynamic board which um, embeds the concept of conflict that we've talked about here uh, where you have uh, a vibrant discussion, an independence of views, and a resolution that allows uh, players in the industry to move forward under these environments. Well, uh, and by the way, the only uh, part of me that doesn't work very well is my hearing, so I apologize for that. But uh, I guess be involved, be engaged, uh, be curious, be imaginative, come up with solutions. Don't take no for an answer. Uh, my, my partner and I, when we started Canadian Hunter, the first 17 companies we went to turned us down. And I can remember flying home from meeting DeFasco or meeting Stelco or meeting McMillan Modell, and we always met with the CEO. And, and by the way, that was a trick when you're 30 and 35 years old and you don't know any CEOs. But I had my, my experience from uh, the Canadian Petroleum Exposition to build on but we got to meet every CEO in, that we wanted to meet, even though they didn't know us. And you can meet them too. And so my advice to people is to study where we're going. What kind of a world are we going to live in? How is Alberta going to prosper in that world? And how can I be part of that prosperity? Because it's a responsibility that we all have to make this happen. And one other dimension is the not-for-profit world. The not-for-profit world has played an enormous part of my, my experience, and a, an enormous and a valuable part of my experience, the not-for-profit world. Because the not-for-profit world is just as complex as, as business, just as, just as difficult, but they have a much more increased human dimension often. And so in my, my experience has been that if you get involved in the hospital, Get involved with the Y. Get involved with the Women's Emergency Shelter. Get involved with Renfrew. There's all kinds of people doing wonderful things that has a direct synergistic relationship to your business career. There's, they're not silos. They are integrated. They're part, what integrates them is our wonderful, wonderful caring society here. That's what pulls them together. 
And by the way, $100 in oil, $100 a barrel oil was the worst thing that happened to this province. And $30 a barrel oil may turn out in the fullness of time to have been one of the best things that happened in this province. Because you don't do a hell of a lot of, of you, you don't do a lot of innovation. You play a lot of golf at, at $100 a barrel. Boy, you, you've got to focus like a laser when it's 30 and 40 bucks a barrel. Because you've got to make, make your, your company has to succeed. Now, we all won't succeed. Some will die. Some will amalgamate. There'll be new technologies come along. Look at this horizontal drilling is a wonderful, wonderful thing. There's four million wells drilled in North America, and they were all vertical until uh, really around 2004, 2006. And that opened up enormous opportunities for technology because now we're dealing with thousands of feet of rock rather than 10 or 20 or 30 feet of rock. So I'm, I may not have answered the question, for, but I will say this. Every one of you has a responsibility to leave this place better than you found it. Every single one of us has that responsibility. Some can make big changes, some can, most of us can make tiny changes, but every single one of us has a responsibility to leave Alberta better than we found it. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Mr. Gray, uh, I, my name is Abe Brown with the Calgary Drop-In Centre and uh, appreciate your work uh, with the Resolve campaign and also I appreciate your reference to the nonprofit world and uh, you know, much like the business community struggles with innovation, and creativity, I think the nonprofit world does as well. So, what kind of advice could you give to help nonprofits uh, with respect to innovation, kind of in a resource constrained environment? Well, uh, I've been involved in the not for profit world for a long time, and I thoroughly enjoy it, whether it's in education or I'm working on the Resolve with, with, with Anne and others on the Resolve campaign now. Uh, although I'm finding when you're over 80, your, your traces aren't pulling quite as hard as they used to when, they were, when you were younger, but, but still you're doing what you can do. And I think for the not-for-profit world, the main thing is that, that people have to have both their head and their heart involved with, with successful not-for-profits. You can't just drive it with your heart. You just can't be 100% altruistic. There has to be a combination of doing things that, that that make a certain degree of common sense, economic sense, as well, and which provides for sustainability as well as being thoughtful and being caring. But if you're, if you're, if you like on your board, if you're a hundred percent service providers on the board, you may have a problem. You need to have both people that can help you with resources as well as people that can help you with with programs, and. For all of us in business, we have a responsibility to be involved in the not-for-profit sector. Not, it's in our own self-interest to be involved <coughs> in the not-for-profit sector. And it's a one, at Canadian Hunter, I would never send people to Stanford or Boston or someplace. I would insist that they get in their management experience in the not-for-profit world. Because that way they get their experience seven days a week 52 weeks a year, a little bit every day. And, 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 and uh, some of the management uh, challenges in the not-for-profit world, to me, are far more complicated, far more, uh, far, more, far more important, and far more hard to sustain than they are in the business world. Business world, if as long as we keep our shareholders happy every quarter, uh, they'll pretty much stay with us. The not-for-profit world has a much broader dimension to that, and it's wonderful training for, 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 your, uh, for your business experience.